Hi, everyone. Today on the show, we're going to talk about self-driving cars and whether they are full speed ahead or stuck in neutral. Hi, everyone. This is Keith Shaw from Today in Tech. Uh, I'm joined today by Jason Torchinsky. He's the co-founder of the Autopian, or is it Otopian? I think it's Autopian. Oto- yeah, Autopian website. And he's also author of the book Robot Take the Wheel, which is probably my favorite title right now. It's a great book. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. We are going to talk a lot about self-driving cars and the state of where we are now. Are we ever going to get to the point where everybody wants to be? Um, there was a, this. Basically, the, re- the reason I want to do this show is because there was uh, a news article last week about uh, companies like uh, Waymo and uh, I think is it GM Cruise or, or the Cruise. They want to expand the service uh, in San Francisco, even though there's been a lot of recent hiccups. And um, and Jason, you cover this this kind of market a lot more than I do. So kind of give me the the rundown of what's going on out there, and then just what you're seeing in the space uh, in in you know early 2023. Sure. Um- I mean, it's it's an interesting space, and um, I have a lot of criticisms of how we're approaching automated driving. That doesn't mean I think I'm, I'm not against it. I think there's a place for it, and it can work. But um, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of the ways we're tackling it are really troubling, and I'll I'll go into this in more detail. But sure. what we're seeing in like San Francisco with like Waymo and Cruise and those guys is um, they're doing tests of what you would call level four driving where it's the car requires no driver and it can pretty much drive anywhere within a set boundary a very specific restrict geofenced area in in the case of san francisco in san francisco and then they have test pilot programs in like austin and phoenix as well yeah um and just recently there was an issue where like about six uh, of these cars, I think they were, uh, were they Waymos or Cruises? I can't remember, but about six of them all gathered at one intersection and just kind of stopped traffic for two hours. And what's interesting is that intersection is actually just a couple blocks from where this happened uh, at some point last year. Very similar kind of thing. They all got confused and somehow all gathered in the same place. There's, right. And so, yeah, and these are very public kind of incidents that happen, right? Of course, because they're in public. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're literally yeah. for the public. Uh, and they operate these uh, as like rideshare services, so you can get them in San Francisco from like, I think it's between like ten at night and like uh, five in the morning or six in the morning. So they're like late night ride sharing things that people can get in and use, and uh, it's fascinating. It sort of works, um, but they're still very much in a test phase. Uh, that actually, I think, is less problematic than what we're seeing in more mainstream. Uh, implementations of uh, semi-automated driving, uh, which we would see in like Teslas or GM Super Cruise or something like that, right? Which would be what's known as a level two driving. Right. System. Yeah. Let's go through the the levels just in case the audience doesn't understand what, what we say when we, you know, I understand them and you understand yes. them obviously, but um, go through as quickly as you can. Sort of the level zero means no automation at all, right? Right. And, well, yeah. So yeah. And the levels are interesting. And the key thing about levels is they do not refer to levels of advancement. The, everything about the SAE levels is confusing, if we're honest. Their levels aren't really levels. What each level actually is describing is the interaction between the human and the machine. Right. That's all they're describing. So like level zero is like the crap I drive, just manual transmissions, some even manual choke. You're doing everything on your own. <laughs> level one would be like cruise control, where it's handling the... Uh, you know, the throttle response. Level two would be a combination of like dynamic crews where it can keep distance and lane keeping and following. That would be things like Tesla Autopilot or GM Super Cruise where the car can on most roads kind of drive uh, independently sort of. But the key thing about level two is that the driver has to be ready to take over at any moment. There is no warning. You have to be always alert always vigilant and always ready to go. That right. is crucial for level two. And that is also why level two gets abused so much right now because there's a lot of confusion there. Then we have level three, which I'd like to talk about in a lot more detail because sure. level three cars are starting to be deployed and it is a disaster. It is extremely confusing. Level three basically states you do not have to pay attention until you do, and then you have to pay attention and we'll talk about why this is such a mess. Uh, level four is the car can drive on its own within a restricted area. 
And level five is the magic. It just drives on its own as well as a human anywhere, anytime, any conditions. And that's a long way off. Right. And so you, so it, currently, if, if you have a car that's sort of like that Tesla or that GM Supercruiser you're talking, that's level two. Um, level two. The car I'm driving, which is from 2010, has cruise control. So I'm actually very happy that I'm at level one. I thought I was at level zero, but I do have cruise control. Um, yeah. But then, yeah, I'm always aware of that because if it's going too fast and I'm coming up on a car, I have to hit the brakes or turn off the cruise control. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, yours is not even dynamic cruise. It's right. just basically right. just a, a set switch for keep this speed right and so so, so yeah. what's interesting is that so the level two would be the the teslas of the world and yep. they've been auto they've been calling it autopilot right they have and, and now they're calling it a uh, full self-driving beta oh okay <laughs> these are very confusing names right because like, people think autopilot and they're thinking okay this is just I, I can just sit back to relax grab a cup of coffee watch a harry potter yep. movie um, and they've been pitched that way. And yeah. recent, you know, and if you look at the, um, well, it, actually, just recently in a court deposition, uh, the there's a tr a video on Tesla's website still where they show a car on autopilot. This video is from like 2016, and it has some text at the beginning of the video that says the human is only in the driver's seat for legal reasons. The car is driving itself. Wow. They specifically say the car is driving itself. You're only there for legal reasons, but that's not really so, right? Because all level two systems require the driver to be ready to take over. And that's and they do have driver monitoring systems. Sometimes it's a torque sensor in the steering wheel. Sometimes it's a camera like GM Super Cruise kind of watching your eyes. Um, some combination of all these things. So the cars, they, they you know, and they do say in their documentation, you know, you have to be aware. You have to be ready to take over. But the way it's marketed, the way it's pitched is always in the context of, you can relax. You don't really have to pay attention, and the car will do it drive on its own. And this is not this is a problem. This is why there's so much confusion right. about how people use level two systems. And there's also level two systems are flawed because not because of the technology as such. It's because it's asking human beings to do something they are fundamentally not good at. And this has been known for decades. Like in uh, 1948, there was a guy named uh, Mackworth who did a study and defined something called the vigilance problem. He was using it, uh, he, the context he was doing it in was watching how people were monitoring radar screens and how they are when something does most of the work and you just have to keep an eye on it and then just be ready to take over if something doesn't go the right way. Humans are terrible at doing this kind of thing. We will lose interest. We will not pay attention well. Right. So in your car, if it's doing 85 to 90 percent of the driving task and you're expected to be ready and alert to take over, that's not something humans are good at at all. It, We're not good at doing that. And, and, we've, and we've, what we've, happens. Yeah, we've got an example of that, too, where the uh, the. The Tesla over uh, Thanksgiving weekend uh, yep. caused a six car pileup on the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. We've got a video of that, right, Chris? You can call that yeah. up. Yeah. Okay. So, um, kind of explain what you think happened because again, there hasn't been an official announcement yet. Uh, but this was a surveillance right. video that they that they saw, uh, and you could just see this car just kind of just stops in the middle of the lane, and and then yep. a couple of cars stop, but then more cars just end up piling in, and you get you, you know you get a pretty major accident there. I think what we're seeing here is is a very graphic illustration of the vigilance problem in action. Uh, I, I don't know. So the, the driver admitted he was using Tesla's full self-driving beta. Um, we don't know exactly why the car stopped, really. We don't know. There are issues with phantom braking. Uh, it could have seen a shadow or something and stopped and got confused. We don't really know. Right. Uh, the driving conditions are about as ideal as you would guess. I mean, it's a perfectly straight road in a tunnel even lighting because it's in a tunnel, no weather because it's in a tunnel. Right. Like you couldn't normally ask for a better situation. You're basically just got a straight road through a room. There wasn't even that much traffic, but still something went wrong when the car stopped. Now the driver, if they were using the system properly, would have seen and felt and noticed that yeah. the car was coming to a halt while he's driving and then taken over, which right. is what you're supposed to do. The fact that the driver didn't is because of exactly what I'm talking about. This is something people are not good at. They put too much faith in these systems, and then they just let them do it. And I don't know how the guy didn't notice he was stopping, but he could have been asleep. He could have been engrossed in something. Yeah. I don't know, but so, this is something we've seen before. So now let's get into the level three discussion. So now you, you're, you're seeing that car op makers are jumping from level two to level three. And yes. they're going to be asking humans to do even more, to pay even more. Well, not even more attention. Just, oh, that's, you're going to tell them that, that they have to the pay less. Yeah, they're going to have to pay less attention, but still be available. Like, that yeah, just no, seems outrageous. 
It's a, I think level three is a potential disaster. And right now, uh, Mercedes has introduced a level three car. Honda has just introduced a level three car. Uh, I know, for example, Honda's hedging their bets with it by keeping the speeds really low. So it's just considered like a traffic jam assist. And here's the problem. Level three tells you you don't have to pay attention, except you do have to pay except, attention sometimes. Right. And that transition between paying no attention and having to take over a car that is potentially driving at highway speeds has not been defined. How that handoff happens is not clear. And I've talked to engineers at major OEMs, at major automakers about this, and the honest response I've gotten, you know, off the record has been that it is kind of a shit show. Nobody really fully understands or has figured out how that's going to work because how can you figure that out? How can you ask somebody to not have to pay attention until you absolutely have to pay attention? Right. How can you guarantee that somebody, if you tell them they don't have to be aware, they may be napping, they may be asleep, they may be doing any number of things. It's in it's a contradiction. You can't you can't demand this, and that's inherent in what level three is. And and, and these then, and these car makers yeah. are not gonna like when you if you go to the store or the store the autos the, the, the car store the car you store. go to the car dealer yeah. the salesman's not gonna give you a list of all right here's when you have to pay attention right like they're not no. gonna know right nobody knows There's, because it's dependent on so many factors yeah. like. If you're in a level three system and you're in a mode where it says you don't have to pay attention, literally anything can happen that might change it. You could, you know, a bird could take a crap on your windshield and block a sensor and then it can't see it. You could get splashed with dirt. The weather could change. The lighting could change. It could, road markings could disappear because of wear and you couldn't see it. There's so many factors. The light could come in funny. I mean, there's so many factors right now that could affect the car not having the confidence to keep driving and require a handoff to the driver. In level two systems, you're always supposed to be ready for that. Right. In level three, by them telling you you're not, it gets right. It gets and, troubling fast. And do they have Plus, a, do they have alerts? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, do they have alerts that sort of beep or you know flash sure lights do. or yeah. something like that? I'm, I'm, yeah, they, there almost definitely are alerts. There's going to be steering wheel vibrations or seat vibrations. They will do all they can to get your attention. Yeah. But that still doesn't guarantee you're going to be able to take over. And if you're traveling at highway speeds, a few seconds means a hell of a lot of distance of travel. So, you know, this is there's a real problem here. Plus. In the event that they are not able to get a driver to take over when the system is compromised and needs help, the only solution that any automaker so far I've seen has had is to put on the hazard lights and come to a stop in an active lane of traffic, which is and a terrible just, idea. And we just that saw what Thanksgiving happened there. Accident, yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. What, that's precisely what happened there at Thanksgiving. It came to a stop in an active traffic lane, and then you have a six-car pileup behind it. No one in their right mind just stops on a highway in an active lane. You try to pull over. But so far, no manufacturer has demonstrated the ability to pull off the road. Yeah. I've seen, I've heard manufacturers say they can or suggest it's possible. I've yet to see a demonstration of this. And uh, I think that has to happen. And it's even harder because if the car is needing you to take over and you don't, it's because something has gone wrong. It's either it's confused about something, yep. uh, there's a sensor issue or something like that. So it's already compromised and it's going to need all of its faculties to be able to get off the road in the first place. So we may need some sort of infrastructure help to make this happen. Yeah. So Jason, it's just not thought through. Yeah. Just Jason, why why do you think the automakers are then trying to push this level three uh, on? on the, the public like why you know why are they going from two to three when it feels like they should just go from two to four if you've got if you've got already testing going on in four in a geofenced area and, and under is it just because sure. they they can't get to four in a dynamic area and with all that other stuff going on and human drivers things like that i mean i think the honest truth is uh capitalism and marketing they want to have something new and shiny and yep. exciting to show they want to go from level two to three uh, it does. I mean, the the pos the promise of someone not having to pay any attention is very appealing to a lot of drivers out there. But the problem is, level four isn't ready. We don't have it solved. Right. It's not ready yet. We haven't figured out how, like, what geofenced areas to do it. I'm not saying it can't be solved, but it's not there yet. And level three is sort of an attempt to try to halfway get there, and in you know in the nearer future, but. It is not thought out. And again, this is less of a tech problem than it is a conceptual problem. Like the problem is less about the tech itself and more about what we're asking 
of both human beings and machines and that interaction. This is a concept problem. You, it doesn't matter how good the tech is, if we still have a system that asks you to not worry about everything until you have to worry about everything. Right. Because that there's no context where that makes sense. Right, right. And it, I, I'm frankly baffled that cars, you know, they're even coming out with level three cars at all, really. It, yeah, I mean, do you think that... Um that we're going to just see a lot of more of these either accidents or public kind of like stoppages where the cars just stop. And, you know, are we going to see more of those before people start paying attention to the problem or like, or are they just going to abandon I, I, level honestly, three altogether? I wish I knew because yeah. um, the issue here, like, so in level three systems, like I think we're going to see a period where, you'll see very speed limited level three where the problems aren't severe because the speeds are so slow. So if it's just something that keeps the car going while you're in a, you know, you're stuck on the five in LA or the 405 and it's a horrible traffic jam and your average speed is 14 miles an hour or six miles an hour, something really low, then you could be reading and the thing beeps at you and you'll have plenty of time to stop before you hit the bumper of the car in front of you. That's easy. Yeah. So you keep it super low like that. Okay, it's fine. It even has a place. Like, sure, it would be nice not to have to really pay attention in incredibly slow traffic jams. But as soon as they want to start deploying this for the other main use case that people want it, which is long highway driving, everything changes because the speeds increase so much, the reaction time increases so much, yep. there's no way to reliably let somebody think they don't need to do anything and then ask them to do everything. There's no way to do that. So... I think we're going to see a slow period of adoption of level three as traffic jam assist things. And then once it gets deployed and people are used to the idea of it uh, into highways, I think we're going to start seeing, I think maybe they're hoping they'll figure out technical solutions before then, but I haven't seen anything yet. And yeah. I haven't seen anybody come up with an adequate solution to the conceptual problem either. And I've talked to OEMs about this and what's really shocking is how how poorly thought out it all seems to be right now. And, you know, I went back when I right. first wrote about. OK, this, well, I want to jump in for a second. So my, my director's yeah. asking me if if you uh, can you explain the shirt that you're wearing? Because <laughs> he, he Oh, likes, yeah, this yeah. is this is it says check yourself before you wreck yourself. This is a Czech car called a Tatra T87. Um, <laughs> this is from the Lane Museum. They have one of these old Tatras. These Tatras were yeah. rear engine cars known for being a little unstable. If you really cranked them, they'd oversteer and flip. And another journalist, uh, for some reason, decided to test this <laughs> thing that people have kind of known about for decades. And he actually flipped one. And that's why it's the well, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's my like, favorite cars. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a coincidence. Like uh, Tesla should follow the, the advice on that shirt. Like, you know. Yeah, Basically. checking oneself before wrecking oneself is always sage advice. Yeah, you, you were talking about uh, some of the the highway stuff, and I want to get into yeah. some of the areas where uh, you, autonomous kind of driving is actually taking place in uh, you know in in some areas where it is being successful. Uh, long haul trucking, for example, I think there's a couple of companies out there that are you have a you have a, if you have an 18 wheeler truck, uh, a, a human driver picks up from the supply or the distribution center and then transfers it to an area. And then the autonomous part is only on those long stretches of highway, like in Texas, uh, Arizona, I think Florida is doing some as well. Is Are you hearing different things than what I'm hearing? Because it f seems somewhat successful for these trucking companies. Well, they're they're testing these things. Nothing's yeah. really deployed yet as such. And um, you know, I don't think it's ready yet by any means. Um, you know, trucks are uh you know, heavy, massive things that require a lot of braking distance. Like yeah. they're, you know, it's a perfect use case for some kind of automated driving, but it's uh it, it's still, you know, re reaction time is important. If it gets confused, the driver still has to be there to take over. Um, we're not going to see truckers losing jobs anytime soon because I think they're always going to be a place for somebody who might be willing to monitor these systems even down the road. It's, um, you know, and some of them are doing what they call platooning also where they have a lead truck yep. and then trucks behind it that are receiving signals from the lead truck. So there's a human kind of helping to drive a train of other trucks sort of. Um, that's possible and that probably will come and it could be considered like a level four and there could be stretches of highway that are specifically determined to be ideal for this. So that probably is something that's going to happen. We're still testing though. We're still not yeah. quite there yet, but it, it might. Where they are seeing a lot of success are in uh, very controlled areas like mining trucks. Yep. 
in mine areas. Those things have been working with automation for a while. Uh, farm combines and things like that. Like there's plenty of places where automation makes a lot of sense, but literally uh, highways and public roads are probably the most chaotic and highest entropy situations you can be in. And in some ways it makes sense those would be the last place that you would actually want to really have these things deployed because you know there's there's more going on there and and it's far more complex in contrast something like a mine or a farm you kind of know the parameters of what to expect so automation works really well right right and and you mentioned earlier that you were that you think that there's going to be some infrastructure work that needs to take place um explain sort of what needs to take place on the roads or the the highways to to help yeah kind of push this forward so I've thought about this a lot, and over uh, before I started the Autopian, I was writing at Jalopnik, and I wrote a few articles kind of about this, just hypothetically, just thought experiments, mm-hmm. thinking. But if we want to have a system where you can, let's say we have highways where you can have automated driving, it would be really helpful if the infrastructure on the highway could help the cars out, especially in situations where they get compromised. So. If something goes wrong and you have to get your car off the road, that means, like we said before, something's gone wrong in the car, so it's going to need help. So if there were some sort of um, beacons of data to help guide the car every few miles or so, it basically loads into the car where the next safe turnoff is, then the car could maybe, even if it lost vision sensors or radar sensors, it could play back what was known to happen. And these sensors could also be fixed and tell if there's already a car on the shoulder, so don't hit this. Like, they could be surrogate gets for the compromised sensors of a car. This isn't cheap, of course, and it requires buy-in from states and highway commission, the federal government. But if we want to have level four style driving with highways that are capable of dealing with automated vehicles, we have to have a way of getting those vehicles off the road if there's trouble. And I don't know really how you would do it without relying on some support from the surrounding environment. And um, I think it's going to be tricky. We'll probably see it in China before here because of their more centralized form of government. They can just kind of shove these ideas down everybody's throats where we have to get buy-in from private companies and governments. Yeah, and like the, governments. The, the regulations that are going on around, you know, just local, state, and then federal, and no one wants to take control, and or, or yeah. you know, some states want to do spend it. Spend the money. No one some, wants to spend the money. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, you know, the infrastructure bill is basically, there's so many bridges that need to be fixed. Um, you, could, yeah. you probably couldn't get a politician to sort of jump on board with this while you've got, you know, bridges that are crumbling or potholes. I, I live up here in New England and potholes is like the number one problem in, in the town that I live in, in the state and things like that. So, um, yeah, but I'm not, and I'm not advocating for communism problem, either. I mean, that's, that's sort of a, <laughs> you know, you're going to, you might see yeah, that wasn't there, my but, original goal, my <laughs> subtext here, but in this one specific case, there is something to be said for a little more central control because you can, we don't even have one's charging standard for electric cars in America right now. Like there's still Tesla's standard and then there's like kind of everybody else's standard. Yeah. If we want, if we want to make this really happen, we're going to need standards. The cars have to talk to each other and let each, like the cars could help each other out too. If you have a level four uh, area that's just like a highway for level four cars and one car is compromised, ideally it should be able to talk to the car behind it and say, hey, or the car in front of it and say, hey, am I clear to get off? How far can I go before I have to stop? Like if we, like we maybe wouldn't even need infrastructure if we could get all the car makers to agree on a car to car communication standard and a set of data that was, could be exchanged readily between cars. Like there's a lot we could do if we cooperate. Right. And um, that's, <laughs> you know, car makers to agree on standards is incredibly difficult. Yeah. You know but how hard it before. is to cooperate, if, you know, in the U.S., right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's possible. We don't have different fuel nozzles for every brand of car out there. So eventually, it's yeah, I mean, so it'll We've eventually it. happen. It might happen at some point, then, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I wanted to, I wanted to touch on another uh, subject that you wrote about in your book, and it's basically uh, if, if we get to the point where you know we're all riding around in, in uh, autonomous vehicles, and you know we are sitting on that concept car couch where we're, we're we're either sleeping or watching a movie, and you know the car takes care of everything. Um, yeah, you you suggest that we are giving up something. Can you explain? Yes. And, and you're more of a car guy than I am. I mean, I I like the idea of being able to get some work done while I'm commuting. 
or right. or if I've got to take a trip to New York, you know, just to, I'd rather just read a book and watch a movie while I'm getting there rather than actually doing the driving part. But on the other hand, I really love going to the go kart track and you know spinning out someone or or passing them, you know, doing a really cool pass. So there is that driving experience that I do like sometimes, but there's other times where I don't. So kind of, I think, what do you mean by by you know that we're going to have to give up something? Yeah, so in, in my in my book, I was a little melodramatic. Yeah. I called it the death <laughs> of the journey, um, but I, I mean it in a serious way because driving right now, aside from being on the toilet, driving is one of the few places where people will leave you alone. You can say, <laughs> "Hey, I'm driving. I can't do a lot now. I can't do this. I can't work. I can't." You know, it, it, so there's a meditative quality. There's a solitude sometimes, or you know, even if you're driving with a friend, you're left alone when you're driving, and there's so few of those those types of situations in modern life right now that we still have plus when you're going when you're going on an airplane you get in at one place you sit and read on the plane and then you get off at another place yep. or you know in an automated car it'd be the same thing you get in you read you watch movies you have a wank you do whatever and you get off at another place now that's like clumsy teleporting you're not go you're not journeying anywhere you're going you're at a point and then you're at another point when you drive, you are engaged in the entire process. You're engaged in the journey. You're driving through places. You drive out of the city. You see the urban landscape fade into rolling hills and yep. farmland. And you go through different places and you see things you normally wouldn't encounter. And if you stop and get gas, you're around people you normally might not be around. And you can go to little restaurants or places or wherever that you normally wouldn't be. You are experiencing an entire stretch. It's you, you're not just ending up somewhere. You've gone through somewhere, and there's a value to that. Like aside from just the meditative value of driving or the enjoyment of just driving, there's something to be said for experiencing what distance is, and for experiencing the sensation of motion and speed, and seeing where you are and seeing how things change. Like we will lose something if we get rid of all that. I genuinely believe that there's something about travel, about the journey, about enjoying a road trip that is worth having and is a different experience than sitting in some enclosed thing, consuming more media. You can do that anywhere. Yeah. You can sit at home on your couch and look at your phone. You can do that anywhere, but you can't move through places or surrounded by windows and see and feel and be in this place. And that has value. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, the the road trip is a great example of this. When I, you know, when I was a kid, you know, the road trip, obviously they 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 piled us in the back of the car, and of course we didn't have seat belts, and uh, I, we did yeah. take one trip in the back of a pickup truck. It was enclosed, but we didn't have any. You know, I think my my stepfather yeah, sure. put a, a mattress in there, and my and <laughs> and you know, my cousins and I were basically just you know making up our own games and and just yep. enjoying life. But now I take a road trip with my kids, and you know, they've all got their phones, and they're all you know ignoring me. But at least when I tell them to shut off the phone, I can actually have a conversation with them during a, a longer sure. commute or a longer road trip than 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 I would. I, I don't know. I think I would probably lose some of that, too. Or you play the license plate game and those dumb, you know, those dumb little car bingo things that, you know, it, there is something just looking out the window while you drive. Yeah. Just, just you just you're you're absorbing this environment, this whole experience. And there's a value to that. And automated cars don't necessarily mean the death of that necessarily. Yeah. Like, for example, one of the, an interesting thing you hypothetically could do is things like road trips could be downloaded because the car is driving itself. You could have a curated road trip of, you know, if like Charlie Day went to every corn dog stand in America and recorded his journey, <laughs> yeah. he could upload that into the cloud and then you could download it to your car and it would take you on literally the exact same journey. You could you could get a professional driver on a track to do a hot lap, download that into your car and, you know, given the constraints of your car's performance, do something similar. Like there's a lot of potential here for the car as a vehicle for playback where you have software that is a journey that you play back. It doesn't you don't we don't have to give up the ability to enjoy an experience of travel just because we're not driving anymore. But it is easy to do that. And if we think that way, if we think of these things as you know, automated cars is freeing us from the burden of having to drive, then we're looking at it the wrong way. Because there's a lot of like, and I'm, I'm not alone here, a lot of people find driving soothing or meditative, or yeah. they can think better, or they just go for a drive, because they like it. And they, I don't see a point in losing that it's too ingrained in part of 
you know, this, uh, the experience of just being alive and being able to move it. Right. Right. 80 miles an hour. Let's, let's get to the, so the, if we're at, let, so let's say we can get to a level four where it's, it, okay. you, you are being able to basically enjoy sort of the road and not have to take over unless it's an extreme condition or even just like, what's the difference between four and five again? The four is, does anything, no driver required at all, yeah. except it's a constrained area. Five is, it does anything anywhere. Okay. Anytime. Um, what are some of the technical problems that are preventing more kind of wide scale adoption of four? And then do you think we're ever going to get to five or is it going to just be, that's an infinite problem where we might never get there? Yeah. So I, I think the four is just, we'll get there to four probably because, um, the things that are preventing it are just all the details of engineering, a uh, massive problem like this. There's so many, I mean, uh, people would call them edge cases, but really it's just reality. You yeah. know, like, you know, there's animals that run in front of cars. I hit a deer in my car not long ago. That's not an edge case. That's just, that's just living in life around yeah. things, you know, like, and, um, there's just all kinds of things for this to solve. And it, you know, and the, you know, there's everything from sunsets can be confusing and can throw confusing lights or the moon sometimes looks like a, a yellow stoplight. You know, there's all kinds of things that have to be figured out. And it's just a process of working through them slowly. If we do level four, that means we can make these things happen in kind of chaos constrained areas where we can kind of control a little bit. So I do think that will eventually happen. There needs to be more buy-in from, uh, again, infrastructure buy-in to say this area is approved for level four driving and steps need to be taken to make sure that it is okay to do that on the highway network. Um, level five, I feel like it's, there's going to be an, like an asymptotic kind of line towards level five. So if level five is here and level four is here, we'll see like one of these curves that almost but never quite reaches it. Yeah. Because I'm not sure level five is reachable. I mean, I don't even think humans are 100% level five because there's some people who say they can't drive in certain cities or you put someone in a, you know, in, in off-road context and they can't really drive. So level five is a meaningless goal in a lot of ways. We right. just have to figure out the best possible, you know, like uh, most useful. And we just start breaking down the problem. So what do people, what do we need most? And, you know, maybe it'll start with like long highway drives or maybe it'll start with, you know, people who are normally disabled and can't drive need good routes inside cities for all kinds of basic life stuff. All of those things are valuable and make sense. We could also think of driving, automated driving in a completely different way than we think now, kind of the reverse of level two. If safety is really the concern. Right. And le the only car maker that's doing it this way is Volvo so far. Um, Consider like you drive, you're considered to be in charge at all times, but behind you in the background, the computer is watching and ready to take over for you instead of the other way around. And that way, if you're doing something, but you're sleepy or you, you're a little buzzed and you shouldn't be or you make a dumb mistake, the computer can step in and correct you and keep you from, you know, actually harming someone or getting into a wreck or whatever. Right. So that's kind of like a reverse level two. And I think that's the that's the path we should be looking at now. If all these people are genuinely being honest when they say the safety is the factor, that's how it should work. Right. You never give up control of driving, but there's something waiting, ready to help you out when you need it. Right. Uh, the problem is that's less sexy and, you know, you don't get to, you know, read a book or watch yeah, a movie. Yeah, I, I, think, I think safety sells, but that's why Volvo's doing it because they've always been a big kind of safety sales that's been their goal. company. That's always and been their goal. And um, I talked to the person who's in charge, like it's a separate company uh, who's in charge of Volvo's uh, automated driving stuff. And that was very much the method and way that they want to proceed. And I think that's, that's the way that makes sense if safety is really what they're talking about. Yeah. And I know a lot of, you know, there's a lot of Tesla fans and other people who say that it's actually a lot safer. Maybe that's true, but you could make it a hell of a lot safer if you kind of flipped the level two dynamic and, you know, just made it guardian angel style instead of autopilot style. So so should we get rid of the, the SAE levels then? Like the level, you know, if they're not truly levels, like is there, is there a better system confusing. that we can come up with that, that explains it yes. a lot better? Yeah. Yes, I think definitely. Like the, the level system is confusing. I think um, the baseline system, would be, I came up with this for Jalopnik a while ago, is basically can you sleep or not? Can you sleep <laughs> in the car while you're in the driver's seat? Yeah. So... Level two, no, you can't. Level four, you can in certain areas. Level five, you can anywhere. We still have the level three issue, 
level three wouldn't exist because you can't reliably sleep and then be asked to be woken up. So basically, that's the only criteria we should have. Can I sleep? So level two, so you can either a semi-automated system. No, you can't. You have to be aware or you can sleep in certain locations or forever. So really, it's just a yes or no thing. And um, where we are right now. Uh, for cars you can buy in the market, no, you cannot sleep in them at yep. all, ever. Yep. And if you take a Waymo or, or whatever uh, automated, you know, like level four test car in like San Francisco or Austin or Phoenix or any of those test projects, then yes, you probably could sleep until you get there in a very restricted area. Right, right. And um, that's the only thing you really need to know. All right. I wanted to ask you another uh, question. This is sort of a hypothetical here. Uh, you also cover the sort of the urban air mobility space. So uh, kind of like automated yeah. autonomous uh, airplanes, aircraft. Uh, we don't actually call them flying cars. We're not going to get to that Jetsons world. Um, They're but not cars. What's more likely, you know, is, is someone going to get into an uh, more likely to get into an autonomous car first or an autonomous sort of air aircraft I the weirdly the autonomous aircraft problem is easier to solve. Yeah, um, autonomy in the sky is actually much more achievable because there's just less stuff up there. There's more room. I mean, it seems daunting because you don't want to crash, but we've been having semi-automated aircraft since the 1920s, since the Sperry autopilot. Right. Um. So you can. That's going to be an easier problem to solve from an automation standpoint. There's still engineering issues of make sure. Uh, it doesn't, you know, like the batteries last long enough and it doesn't fall out of the sky. And, you know, you have to solve all of the usual issues that happen when you can't just pull over if something's wrong or just stop. But I think that can happen. Like they've already got automated drones that work really well. Most of these designs that we're seeing now are basically just very scaled up drones with passenger compartments. And I think if we're talking like hops from, you know, one rooftop in a big city to another rooftop, I think that's possible and I think that can happen and it will likely be automated much more fully right. before cars are because all and also there's a lot more regulation and infrastructure assistance. You have air traffic controller systems and there's radar signals or radio type signals that they can lock onto. Like there's a lot of help from in the in the aviation world to let pilots fly that pilots already use now for navigation and for all kinds of things and they're in communication the car world isn't like that you don't get in your car and talk to a control tower and they help guide you to where you're going it doesn't work that way right but that infrastructure already exists so it's got a it's a combination of less stuff to run into more space and more support so i think automation in the sky is in a more full way will probably happen first. But then we're never going to get to the part where it's like where I can jump into my DeLorean and fly like in Back to the Future 2 or, or the whole Jetsons flying car I thing. I mean, because like, that's like taking the worst problems of the, of the car stuff and now moving them to the air. Right. I mean, it's tricky because they've had flying cars for a while, a long time, like every and, and they're always two years away, always, <laughs> always two years away. But the problem is just the... Um, when you're driving, you're dragging around the extra hardware to make you fly. So you have big wings you have to fold up or you have to leave at an airport and dock yeah. into somehow. And then when you're in the air, you're carrying around the stuff you need to drive. So it, the problem is you end up with a not great airplane and a not great car. And sometimes this compromise is okay. In the case of amphibious vehicles that can go on water and land, it doesn't really matter that much if it's not that great a boat because right. you just want to be able to drive into the water and put her around like an old amphicar, and it's still fun. It's not crucial. But with an aircraft, it's, you know, everything's a little more serious and it's a little different. It's not just a little, you know, boat you're puttering around in, you're in the air. So it's tricky because the two machines are, you know, there's just so much different hardware required to be in the air as there is to roll around on the ground. All right, uh, Jason, that's all the time we've got uh, for today's show. Thank you uh, for joining me. Where can kind of people go find your book? It's a, it's a great title and it's a, it's a great read. Yeah, gonna... Robot Take the Wheel you can find on Amazon or even better, your local independent bookstore or online independent bookseller, but it should be widely available. And of course, you can read stuff I write at the Autopian. Uh, every day, I've got to crank out more articles, so you'll definitely <laughs> see stuff there. All right, and we'll put a link of that in our in our description to, to go to that site. It's a gr it is a great site, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, so uh, also don't forget to like and uh, subscribe to this channel and add any comments that you have uh, on this show below. And join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.